introduction to the Song of Solomon. In session one and two, the focus is to equip your understanding by giving you information about the context and the principles of interpretation. That's what we hope to cover in these first two sessions. We're, we're uh, providing a road map to bring understanding of the big picture of what's going on in this book. We're going to look at some of the introductory principles on how to interpret the song. I'm aiming for your mind in these first two sessions so that it will give you a context, and then the next 18 sections we will aim for the heart. There are many interpretations of this song. However, we are addressing the two main ones. And I have found that each of these approaches, each of the interpretations to the song, many different approaches are valid and they're edifying. And the Lord's creative abilities are manifest in a very powerful way in the song as it is in all of Scripture. And we don't want to limit the Lord's ability to speak He speaks on many levels. There's many interpretations of this song. The reason I'm saying that, and I'll mention it a little bit later, is that uh, there seems to be a kind of quite a uh, feisty spirit that comes along with the Song of Solomon. And people, no, it doesn't mean that. It means this. No, it doesn't mean that. It means this. And they go back and forth. And and my purpose is in saying a, a song that of which the purpose is to enhance love. I can't imagine... Uh, having uh, this feisty debating spirit on a song that's so holy and so noble that has been set forth in the, in the Word of God to produce love and passion in the heart of God's people. So we want to lay down that kind of attitude, and we don't want people that are students of this class to carry that attitude out of this place to other places. We want a generous spirit. I tell you, the Lord speaks at many, many levels in this song. He doesn't only speak at the level that you understand. And the way that I'm going to present this is only one of many, many presentations that are valid in the heart of God for this study. Okay. The natural interpretation. This school of thought is depicting a literal human love story between King Solomon and his bride, the Shulamite. It is a natural love story based on biblical principles that are written, that is written to honor and inspire deeper love within marriage. The natural interpretation has become very popular in the last hundred years. However, for the 2800 years previous, when this book was first written about 900 years BC, there's only been a few commentaries that have approached the Song of Solomon through the natural interpretation depicting the glory of married love. I, I, I believe in that interpretation. But I just want to say it's a fairly new way to view it in terms of church history. The 2,000 years of church history plus the 900 years before when Solomon wrote the book 900 years B.C., 2,900 years we've had, 28, 2,900 years we've had this book. There are two basic storylines when viewing the book or when interpreting this love song as a natural love story. There's two basic uh, storylines, and you can read those on your own, and they're very fascinating. I enjoy both of them. This sounds corny, but it's true. I've read a number of books on both of them. I've been moved to tears. I mean, I went like, oh, my. I mean, it's it's the ultimate of romance, both storylines of the the natural interpretation. The allegorical interpretation, and that's the way that we're taking it in this course. Uh, An allegory is a story that is totally symbolic without any historical facts as its basis. There's not very many facts that are actually represented in this book. It's not, a, it's not a book telling a lot of facts about the details of a love story, but it's really a book with uh, emotional sentiment that give hints about facts, but those facts aren't concrete, so we don't spend a lot of time on those as the people who give the natural interpretation would need to. Natural details of facts are not important in an allegory. For, for instance, the very popular allegory that we all know, the Chronicles of Narnia or the Wizard of Oz. That is uh, often uh, seen as, those are, are allegories that uh, many people see uh, powerful messages in stories like that, of these fairyland kind of stories that there's messages hidden behind them. This view says Solomon was writing a love song to describe spiritual truth about the love relationship with the coming Messiah. And of course, that's the view that we're taking in this course. It's the most common, it was the most, it is the most common interpretation for the 1900 years of church history and the 2800 years since it was first written. 
Now, the Bible itself affirms the use of allegorical interpretations. However, allegorical interpretations, though they are important and helpful, they are important and helpful only as long as we use them to illustrate truths that are established throughout the New Testament. It's a very, very important point that I'm making right now, and I'll, I'll give more in writing there, is that giving symbolic meaning of events in the Old Testament, or even in the New Testament, I believe we're only safe if, those, if the meanings that we extract from the, symbol, uh, the, uh, the, the uh, symbolism are meanings that are central New Testament meanings. In other words, when somebody comes and says, I have the hidden meaning, the symbolism about Summon Song of Solomon, but they give you a truth that you can't find clearly established in the New Testament, especially in the Pauline epistles and the letters of Paul, you want to be very cautious of that meaning. Allegories are useful and helpful only in as much as they're establishing the common truths of the New Testament, especially the Pauline doctrine, the Pauline, uh, uh, the whole uh, locus of truth that Paul the Apostle was responsible for giving the church. We refuse to make our primary interpretation of the Scripture allegorical. We don't want to do that. We don't want to teach that. And though teaching this book, some might be encouraged to approach all of Scripture in an allegorical way, and they may be a bit reckless, and we don't want to do that. If you're going to approach a passage allegorically, you have to do it with great care, and you have to make sure you're not bringing forth a truth that is not powerfully established already in the Word of God, especially in the New Testament. I believe this love poem expresses the emotions related to an actual romance. I believe the story is real. I believe the romance really took place. Again, you don't find a lot of facts in Song of Solomon. You don't say, and then on the third day, I went and visited her, and she said to me. There's not a lot of detail like that, but there's, there's hints at facts that you have to put together, piece it together. Okay. Do not be narrow in thinking that the only valid insight into Scripture is the one you're familiar with. This is the point I was mentioning earlier, that we don't want to approach this book that has many ways to look at it with a debating spirit. I call it a feisty spirit, a, a debating spirit, a pugnacious spirit. Books like the Song of Solomon, the book of Revelation, people are more interested in winning an argument than they are being impacted by the glory and the power and the splendor of Jesus Christ. We want nothing to do with that, with the, the, the students of this class. As you go forth from this place, go forth with a charitable heart. When someone tells you a different way, say, boy, if you can receive the kiss of God's heart, go for it. And we want to applaud and, and uh, uh, bless anything the Holy Spirit does that enlarges people's hearts in the first commandment. I recommend this song to be one of your favorite hobbies. That might be an interesting concept, that a book of the Bible could be a hobby, but it is. It's one of my very favorite hobbies. Yes, it is my job, it's my calling, it's my mandate, but it's a significantly pleasurable holy recreation. Sometimes at the end of a day, when I'm just burnt out, or I got a couple of days where I'm not overloaded, I'll go tuck away with a book of Song of Solomon and a marker, and I could just go somewhere somewhere far away, and come back. And, the, and different commentaries, I, I read them for fun. I take them on airplanes. Anytime I get a chance, I'll bring a commentary on Song of Solomon just to kick back and relax. And you say, relax reading a commentary. Well, once you get into the flow of this book, I believe it's possible, and I believe more than relax, you can find a holy entertainment that will cause your spirit to soar. It might be laborsome at first, but only at first. It might be laborsome at first, but only at first. It will be enthralling and exhilarating before long if you stay with it. Okay. The allegorical interpretations. Now we're locking in not to the natural interpretation, but we're locking into the allegorical. And there's three common approaches to the allegorical one. There's many more than three that are available, but there's three common ones. Three common ones that I appreciate. Boy, there are some wild commentaries on Song of Solomon, you can't even fathom where the cults and the feminist movement and humanist movements and bizarre religious crazy people take the Song of Solomon. They, I've got some the strangest things you could imagine that are written books on commentaries of Song of Solomon. I'll just leave that for the imagination. But we're really interested in the three main historical approaches to the allegorical interpretation. Firstly, 
The relationship between God as the bridegroom and natural Israel as the bride. God as the bridegroom and natural Israel in the Old Testament as the bride. This is a very uh, common approach in the Old Testament. Matter of fact, it's the most significant way that the nation of Israel has approached it. They, they've uh, approached it as the bridegroom Messiah uh, significantly more than they would have approached it as the love relationship between a man and a woman in the natural. One of the main ways that they, uh, the, the Jewish community, the Jewish tradition has many different approaches to the allegory. Uh, one of the favorite ones within this uh, God and Israel interpretation is the, the bride being the Torah being the law of God. In other ways, the law of God is the husband. And, I've, and they, they take it both ways. Other ways, they see it as the temple. Other ways, it's Jerusalem. Some of the Catholic interpretations see the bride as Mary. So Again, there's all kinds of, of, of different versions of this. And, and I've read many of them and just, I find them fascinating, though some of them, some of them are ridiculous. It is interesting to read what the human spirit can come up with on something so awesome and powerful. But what I want you to know is don't lock yourself in to thinking that you've got the whole picture because you've understood one line of thought on this. There's going to be a great revival spirit on natural Israel before the Lord returns. I believe the Bible makes that clear. The Holy Spirit's going to release a tremendous measure of power. The power of God to bring Israel, natural Israel, to Jesus. And my prayer, and more than that, my conviction, is that God is going to use the romance in the Song of Solomon as a part of his strategy to to gather the harvest in Israel. I believe the Holy Spirit is going to unlock this book and he's going to stun the nation of Israel with his passion for them and his ability and willingness to freely forgive them and to crown them in the glory of God. Secondly, The relationship between Jesus and the corporate church is the second allegorical, main allegorical interpretation. The first one is the, is God and Israel. The second one is Jesus and the corporate church. The, the church in its entirety through all of church history as a bride. And though I believe the, the bride is the church through all history, I mean, I've, I've got uh, some books that take the, the historical approach and they find like, in the first century, they'll find chapter 1 and 2. In the third, fourth, and fifth century of church history, they'll find chapter 3 and 4. They actually find church history, the corporate church historically, its history mapped out prophetically and foretold in the book. This book is an amazing book. I don't want you to be so overwhelmed when you approach it that you say, well, forget it. I just want you to honor it and respect it. I want you to say, the genius that wrote this book is such a skilled songwriter. He's such a skilled genius as a script writer. His name is God. But there's no way you're going to capture everything in his heart through our small, limited human, human capacities. Thirdly, the relationship between Jesus and the individual believer. And that's the way we're approaching it. I'm approaching the, the journey as an individual Growing in holy passion before the Lord. The individual, although I, I could take it as the corporate church. I could take it as the nation of Israel coming to Jesus through history and the, the Lord wooing them. Because there's plenty of information and knowledge about that in commentaries. And again, there's a dozen other allegorical interpretations that I, hope I wouldn't even want to dignify some of them. Okay, the focus of this study is to interpret the book as an allegorical love song between Jesus and the individual believer. This approach offers a practical spiritual insight for our personal lives as we, as we relate to growing a personal passion for Jesus. Okay, our approach to this study. In this particular study, our focus will be on principles that aid individuals in the progression of holy passion in a personal way. That's our, our, personal, our approach to this study. Okay. Four reasons why all believers are included in the bride. The reason I'm saying this is that I skipped uh, some of the notes in the pages earlier. The page earlier is that there's uh, I don't know how, how to exactly define this, but there's little groups in the body of Christ. They've been all through church history that imagine the bride. They they interpret it allegorically as individual believers. They're really into that, but they imagine that only a few attain to this privileged position of the bride. And so they come up with a spiritually elite group, and a lot of them kind of isolate away from society in, in, in some uh, kind of strange ways, and they imagine 
that they and their little group of six or eight or ten or twelve with a couple scattered groups around the globe will enter into this bridehood. And they, they see the entry into this grace of bridehood as primarily resting upon their ability to press in or, uh, more diligent than everybody else. And though I appreciate their heart to press into the Lord, I love that, but I believe that, that they end up uh, confusing a number of things. And I'm going to give you four reasons why believers, I believe believers are included, all believers are included in the bride that is revealed at the end of natural history. Firstly, the maturity of the bride is the fruit of Jesus' prayer. Jesus prayed here in John 17, 26, which is my life verse. It has been for many, many years. If you're looking for one, feel free to take it. It's worked for me for many years, for near 20 years plus, possibly. And Jesus is praying. It's his high priestly prayer in John 17. He's ending it, and he prays, Father, the love that you have for me, put it in them. Put it in them. The love you have for me, impart it to them. They would love me like you love me. And I believe his prayer, his position of authority before the Father is a significant assurance as to why we're going to make it. When the Son of God stands before the Father in the will of God, anointed by the Holy Spirit, and with energy says, put your love into them, the Father says, you can count on that, Son, I'll do it. And I believe that the Father is going to answer the Son's prayer. Jesus is interceding for His people to love Him like the Father loves Him. The reality of the bride is based significantly, not only, upon Jesus' intercession, upon the Father's zeal for Jesus. It's based secondarily upon our response. Our response of commitment is important, but it is not the main thing in the equation. It is important that we say yes. But I tell you, when you said yes to Jesus in the new birth, that yes carried more power than every other yes you will say. That yes will get you further than every other yes that follows afterwards. The big yes was at the new birth. And though I believe in saying yes with extravagance and wholeheartedness, the yeses that follow the new birth are of of lesser importance than that yes. There's that great yes of God that, I mean, that great yes of the human heart to the grace of God, that's the big one. We have to say that one or we're in significant trouble. And once we've said that one, I believe we will be a part of the bride with the beauty of God imparted to us. Secondly, the power of the full revelation in heaven transforms the bride. His unveiled glory in heaven is a successful agent of transformation to the redeemed heart. I'll add the verse 1 John 3, 2 right here, where John the Apostle said, when we see him, we'll be like him. Because the unveiling of his splendor, sometimes in history called the the beautific vision, or the vision of the beauty of God, the, the beautific vision, seeing the beauty of the Lord, it transforms our emotional chemistry. It changes us. To see the beauty of the glory of God changes us on the inside. That's a biblical principle established throughout the Old and New Testament. Number one, all believers in heaven will see the splendor of Jesus. Seeing him is what changes us to be like him. All of us will be unusually dedicated on that day because all of us will see him in his full beauty. You will be unusually dedicated when you see him in his full beauty. I've often said to the Lord, Lord, if I could see what Paul saw, I could endure what he endured. The the measure of Paul's life is not in his unusual dedication, it's in his unusual measure of understanding and revelation. Paul did not have a more righteous heart as a sinner than you had. That's not what the strength of Paul, the glory of Paul's life is not in his human zeal. And a lot of people view Paul's life through the grid of his unusual human zeal, and I believe that's an entirely wrong and non-biblical view of Paul the Apostle. 2 Timothy 1, Paul the Apostle said, he goes, I have been made an example of the patience of God. When Paul's life is fully understood, we have confidence in the patience of God toward sinners. Most people read Paul's life through various biographies, people write, and they're, they're overwhelmed at Paul's unusual dedication. And Paul himself said, if you view my life right, you will see the patience of God to sinners is what you're going to see. You're going to see the power of of revelation upon a weak and broken heart, the power that revelation can have. He says in Philippians 3.8, he said, to see the excellency of him, 
therefore I give up everything. When I see the excellency of his beauty, then I give up everything. Paul's commitment flows out of his vision. And in heaven, we'll all have a full vision. So believers, sincere and struggling, the Lord says, don't worry, they'll be all fully committed when they see the beauty of my son. Okay, thirdly, what significantly ensures the bride's destiny is the ravished heart of God. One of the key phrases of this whole uh, study, Jesus speaking, you've ravished my heart, my sister, my bride, you've ravished me. Number one, his ravished heart embraces whosoever will voluntarily say yes. Anyone that says the primary yes of redemption, his heart is ravished for them. Yes, we want to say those secondary yeses as we grow in, in greater maturity. We want to say yes a thousand times. We want to say yes daily to the Holy Spirit. But that primary yes of redemption is established at the new birth where the yes is put in our spirit and sealed there by the Holy Spirit. That primary yes of redemption that is dropped in the human spirit, sealed in our spirit, 1 John 3, 9, John said, when you're born of God and the yes is in your spirit, you can't just turn away and live a life of sin because that yes of the Holy Spirit, that seed of God has power. It pulls you when it's there and it's genuine and it's real. So when Jesus looks at Those believers who have said yes, and that primary yes of redemption called the new birth, the yes of God is put in their spirit. His heart is ravished. He looks at them in an entirely different way. He loved them before they said yes, but now he enjoys them and is ravished over them. God loves every unbeliever. He so loves the world, but he enjoys the church, believe it or not, even though he disciplines the church, and we'll look at that much more through the course. He enjoys us even though he finds it necessary to discipline us. He is not more ravished by one group within the body over another group. There's not some group tucked away the side. God says, now, I I like most of you guys, but I really like them. That, That isn't how it works. His heart is ravished for his people. And it's that very knowledge that awakens your heart. The idea, see, people say, well, no, if you tell people that, then they'll get lazy. I say, no, it's opposite. You tell weak and broken people that, it'll give them hope, it'll give them vision, and they'll rise up and they'll throw off their shame. They'll be, they're hopeless without that. No, if we threaten them, they'll lose out significantly, then they'll rise up. I go, no, if we threaten them, they'll lose out significantly, they'll give up in hopelessness and shame. Though it's not human logic I'm using, it's, it's biblical theology. He's ravished over his people, and it's that very reality that gives the hopeless hope. It's that message that we shout loud and uh, clear to the highways and byways where people go, well, in that case, I'm going to reestablish my vision to be a lover of God. In that case, I'm going to start over again if, if it really counts, if, if God will take me and he likes me. Wow, are you kidding me? It's exactly opposite of what these groups fear. They fear people will get lazy, and I say they will be invigorated and extravagant because they'll have a present, hopeful spirit day in and day out when they encounter their own weakness. You get a a group of weak people, like us, that have a daily hopeful spirit in the Lord, they'll rise up with energy and run into his arms instead of quit in despair like a hopeless hypocrite and just give way to the spirit of despair. This is a very significant message. The ravished heart of God. Okay. In heaven, there's only one people. There's not two different classes of the redeemed. In heaven, there's only one, there's only one group. There's only one class of the redeemed. Yes, we have difference in glory. God says in our resurrected body, we will have different elements of God's splendor and glory. But there's only one class. There's only the redeemed. There's not the redeemed and then the super redeemed and then the unbelievable redeemed who are the bride. It doesn't work that way. Jesus himself prayed, Father, that they would be one like you and me are one, that all of them would be one like you and me are one. And in heaven, this prayer will be answered. There will be one people in heaven, one redeemed in heaven based on the prayer of Jesus. It flows out of the Father's, it flows out of the Father's plan to have a people, a unified people. Which is found in Ephesians 3, 6, and 7. Jews and Gentiles, all of them brought to one, to unity. Ephesians 1, 10 is another verse. E, I want to encourage you. 
Don't be uh, offended by the remnant bride groups. If you, you'll run into them, if the Holy Spirit is emphasizing the bride of Christ more, you'll run into more people that will disdain the idea that we could all be the bride. They'll, they'll think it's going to lull everyone to sleep. They don't understand it's just, it's just opposite. When I run into people like that, I run into them quite a bit because I talk on the subject in conferences quite a bit, so I get at people and they get real mad. How dare you tell those people? And I know what group they're in and what literature they're reading, and I understand it. But you know what? I'm excited they're going for the bridal revelation in the first commandment. I'm not worried that they're mad at me or they got some thing I don't agree with. I'm thrilled they're going wholehearted. I look at them and go, go for it. Quit smiling. I'm mad at you. Just go for it. I love it. Mwah. This is awesome. Get everybody going for it. Well, if you get them off the hook and get them secure in the Lord, they'll all get lazy. No, no, it goes exactly opposite. Let me give you a little warning. For those of you that uh, might be uh, tempted by that point of view is that when we are uh, seeking to measure our attainment, because the kind of the remnant bride groups, I call them, some of them have what I call bride pride, but anyway, these some of these remnant bride groups get into, are you the bride? I am, I'm not sure, and they get so preoccupied with measuring their attainment, they lose their ability to focus on Jesus. It's a common distraction. That's inevitable amongst many of these, uh, this, this kind of elite spiritual kind of context. When you put your energy on trying to measure if you're in or you're out, if you're higher or you're lower, you will lose so much ability to be focused and to flow in love. People ask me, I hear, hear this question all the time, well, how do you think you're doing all this? I go, I don't have a clue. I don't ever measure where I'm at. Well, are you further than last year? I don't know. All I care about is I get up tomorrow morning and I want to say yes. And I don't know how that fares with yesterday or how that fares with other people. I, that doesn't really matter. I just want to say yes. I don't, I don't have a little, you know, measuring stick by the door and, you know, mark it there and say, oh, he grew a couple inches. I, I don't do any of that. I don't know how I'm doing compared to a year ago. I just know I want to say yes real hard today, and I leave it right there. And I've done it that way for years and years and years. But for years before that, I used to measure all the time. And I tell you, it will shut you down. It will distract you. It will throw you off course. That measuring, if you're in or out, better or worse, is an absolute distraction to growing in the love of God. Just say, I don't know. I don't do that. I just do yes in my spirit to God in the present tense. Okay, a working definition of the bride. A working definition of the bride is mature bridal partnership. Or simply spiritual maturity. That's a working definition of the bride. Mature bridal partnership. That's what we're talking about. Now, I think it's important to understand, theologically, we are described as espoused or engaged to the Lord in this age, and the consummation of the marriage is in the age to come. That's a theological uh, a truth that uh, uh, is well established in the New Testament. And old, we are pictured as engaged to the Lord. As espoused to the Lord. But in the, in the Hebrew tradition, when you were legally engaged, I mean, when you were engaged, formally engaged, you were legally married. And when a man and a woman were engaged, if they broke the engagement, they had to get a legal divorce certificate. So they were considered man and wife in the engagement. They waited one year, then they consummated the marriage. Mary and uh, Joseph and Mary. When she conceived by the Holy Spirit Jesus, it was considered adultery if she became pregnant because she was married to Joseph, though they were only engaged because it was a, a legal marriage set up. But they wait one year. And then the marriage is, is consummated. So in the full sense of the, uh, of the theology, we are not the bride. We're not in mature bridal partnership in the full uh, ideals until in the age to come. But we live in the spirit of the bride now. We want to love like the bride loves in this age. So technically we are espoused. We are promised. We are engaged to Jesus, legally married, but the consummation is in the age to come. But the working definition of the bride, the spirit of this definition is mature partnership. Mature bridal or mature loving partnership. It's a partnership in the harvest that's flowing in the great commandments, the two great commandments. I have here the goal is to live like the bride before heaven. That's the goal. We pray devotional prayers to live like 
to love like the bride loves now while still on this side of eternity. We will all love like the bride on the other side, but we want to love like the bride right now. Why? It's our destiny. It's our spiritual, it's our spiritual genetics. So you're going to love like the bride does eventually, and if it's true, if it's your destiny, and it's your spiritual genetics, why not now? Why wait till then and squander your life on the earth? There's, there's absolutely no sense. It's the deceitfulness of sin that blinds and chokes our heart. So though nobody can claim, I am the bride now, all that kind of desire to classify and I'm in, you're out, that's just all crazy stuff. That's, that's uh, I just th- think of it as all distraction. We want to be in love, living in the spirit of the bride, in this pursuing mature bridal partnership, knowing that the consummation and the establishing of full bridehood is not to the age to come, but that spirit of the bride is what we have right now. <clears throat> okay. The Holy Spirit exalts Jesus in the Song of Songs. The Holy Spirit exalts Jesus in the Song of Songs. Okay. I've talked about some basic cautions I have of the allegorical interpretations because this is an allegorical interpretation to see Jesus exalted in the Song of Songs. That, it requires an allegorical approach to see that. And again, throughout church history, there's been some reckless, crazy doctrines and thinkings of even major church leaders who led the church into different uh, dimensions of error and heresy even because their whole approach to Scripture was allegorical. And I, I just need to say that over and over. You need to be informed as to that reality. Again, the allegorical approach is biblical, but it's biblical within caution, and only if we are establishing and illustrating truths that are clearly established in the New Testament, especially the Pauline epistles. Okay, the Holy Spirit is filled. The Holy Spirit is filled with desire and longing for the person of Jesus. Jesus is on his heart And all the Holy Spirit does, it's inconceivable to me for the Holy Spirit to write a book of the Bible without Jesus being the predominant theme on his heart. Just that simple logic right there. Jesus spoke of himself. From all the scriptures, he told the disciples on the road to Emmaus. I take the word all literally to imply that each of the 39 books of the Old Testament, he spoke of himself. In all the scriptures, he spoke of himself. I believe that he talked those, uh, the, uh, those disciples on the road of Emmaus, their heart was burning within them. He was unfolding, I believe, book by book. I think he was saying, he was talking about the Christ in each one of them, just a few moments possibly in each book. But I believe he literally did it in all of them because it's what the Scripture says. We believe the Holy Spirit inspired all of, Christ, uh, all of Scripture. He has a fierce loyalty. He has a fierce jealousy for people to be filled with Jesus. I think even a fundamental understanding of the Holy Spirit, even a beginning understanding, would lead you to the conviction everything he writes is focused ultimately on inspiring the human heart to love Jesus. I don't know the Holy Spirit very well, but I know him enough to know that he is in love with the man Christ Jesus. He looks for every opportunity to take the things that belong to him, his beauty and his splendor, and reveal them to the church. Now, I'm going to uh, talk just a, uh, just a moment about my own personal mandate and journey into this song. How did I get involved in this song? Because I'm, the reason I want to share this with you is because I, I want to, hopefully, this story, very brief, I'll give you the very brief version. I'll tell you more about it in some of the other sessions that will inspire some of you. Why is this song for me? Well, it, it goes back to John 17, 26. That's, again, been my life goal since I, my life first since I was about 20 years old. 43 now, so over 20 years. Father, that the love wherein you love Jesus would be put into my heart. Father, the love that you love Jesus. Father, I have that, that string, that one string on your heart I can pluck. I know you want to do it. You've already said it, and I'm going to put myself before you. Put that big bullseye on my chest before the Holy Spirit. Here I am. The love you have for Jesus. Aim here. And the Lord says, wait upon me, and I will strengthen you in whatever area you wait upon the Lord. You want to wait upon the Lord, you'll be strengthened. You want to move in more power to heal the sick? Wait on the Lord. Pray in that way, and you'll move in more power to heal the sick. You want to see more evangelism? You want to see more love for Jesus, wait on the Lord, and that area of your life will be strengthened. I tell you, it will. Someone told me that years ago, so I believed it. I said, I want to be strengthened in John 17, 26. So one day I was in my office, and it was in July uh, 1988. 
I was in the office one morning, and I was having a devotional prayer time. I didn't really have much to do with Song of Solomon. I knew the two or three kind of key verses. I knew, I heard somebody mention it. I think it was on, maybe it was even on a, uh, as I remember right, it was on a, uh, like a, car, a wedding card or something, you know, Song of Solomon 8, 6. And I said, oh, I, got, I haven't looked at that book, that verse. So I opened it up, uh, Song of Solomon 8, 6, and Jesus is inviting the people of God to put him, Jesus, as a seal upon their heart. And something very strange began to happen. I know this is a subjective experience, but it's a very powerful and real one. I just began to weep before the Lord. And I was put in John 17, 26, Lord, the love that you have for your son, put it in me. Put your seal upon my heart, the seal of fire that no water can put out, no sin can put out, no persecution, no distractions, but the fire of God upon my heart. And I was praying this, and I just began to weep, and, and my spirit just began to gently tremble in the presence of the Lord. And I knew something strange was happening. This was July 88. So I called the receptionist, and I say, whatever you do, don't uh, have anybody interrupt me. Something strange is happening because I hadn't had anything like this, and I don't know, you know, it was very, I've not only called the receptionist one time uh, in my pastoral life from the office and said, don't let anybody interrupt because the power of God's on me. It was this one time. It's the only time it's ever happened. And I'm, tr- and I'm just gently trembling in my spirit. And I'm weeping. And Father, seal me. Put your love in me. And all of a sudden, the phone rings. The secretary goes, the receptionist says, uh, Bob Jones, one of the prophetic men, some of you have heard about, those of you that live here know about him. He said that he's heard the audible voice of the Lord audibly for you right now and he says i know i'm not supposed to let no one in but i thought you wanted god to get in if he called he goes is that okay i said if god calls always let god in i said that's always good i said good good discernment good discernment so i'm talking to bob jones i go bob what's what's happening he goes uh i got 90 seconds he goes i have a ministry trip my bags are packed he says, they're in the car. He says, I woke up this morning. My alarm, for some reason, did not go off. And I woke up. And when I woke up and sat in my bed, I looked at my clock. And I was, they were coming in 10 minutes to pick me up. And I just got right out of bed to take me to the airport. And he said, and it was at that moment, the strangest time, he said, I heard the thunderous audible voice of God right then. He goes, it shook me. It completely al- 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 grabbed me, alarmed me, alerted me. And he said, he spoke to me a verse. He said, it's Song of Solomon, chapter 8, verse 6, 7. He goes, frankly, I haven't had a time to look it up. I jumped out of my bed, put through some clothes in, in the uh, suitcase. The guy's honking at the door. I'm in the car, and the Spirit of God said, call Mike right now. I told the guy, stop, back up. He runs inside. He goes, I haven't even read it. He goes, I don't even know what it is. He said, I always thought Song of Solomon, he goes, that's a strange little book. I thought it only had about four chapters. He goes, it has to have eight. I just heard it. I said, it has eight. Trust me. He said, here's what the Lord told me. He said, the Lord told me, whatever Song of Solomon 8, 6 is. I mean, that's not how the Lord said it. But Bob says, the Lord said, Song of Solomon 8, 6. This is what I am going to do in the body of Christ worldwide in this generation. I'm going to release that anointing in Song of Solomon 8, 6. And he said, Mike, whatever it is, it's serious. I said, Bob, it is serious. Trust me. And it's the verse that talks about the seal of divine fire empowering the heart to walk in love. And he says, and the Lord told me to tell you something. Secondly, he said, this is your calling. This is the mandate you're going to walk in all the days of your life. You're going to walk out whatever that is. He said, got to go. And he hung up. And I'm weeping. I, have, I mean, I'm weeping for the phone call. John 17, 26, Song of Solomon 8, 6. I'm on my knees and here it is. And I'm saying, Lord, this is awesome. It was such a tenderizing. But then after that lifts, uh, a day or two goes by. And my first response is, I'm a little bit confused by this. Song of Solomon. I never read Song of Solomon. I started thumbing through the book. And frankly, I I was, I think a a, a fair word is to say I was hesitant. I looked at it. I said, Song of Solomon, you flower and roses and beauty and color and fragrance. Now, some of you know that. My father was literally a world champion boxer. He was literally world champion. And I grew up in the gyms. I grew up in boxing gyms all my life. I trained for boxing all my life. He hung out with guys that were world champion, Jack Dempsey, Floyd Patterson, some of you old timers. He was personal friends with them and, and hung out with them in, in, some, in some ways. And he was involved in the mafia. My dad was. He beat up people. Family friends, if you call them friends, were killed and found in their cars. And a number of times when I was a young person, I remember it. I remember 
My dad coming home and say, well, so-and-so died. They found him in his car. And I thought, oh, what a bummer. It was a few years later till I put that. That's really not right. That happened a couple times. I grew up in taverns and boxing gyms. And, and I said, God, I, I'm the son of a boxer. You know, Song of Solomon. I said, give it to the women's ministry. Give me the, <laughs> give me the life of David, the book of Romans, the book of Revelations, not the Song of Solomon. I beg thee, O God, not Song of Solomon. So I was confused, perplexed, and hesitant. Let me tell you, tough guys, you tough guys, you were made for the Song of Solomon. Now, I know I just implied that I was a tough guy just then, but just let that one go. But anyway, my second response. I was perplexed. I I was like excited because it was God, you know, and I had such a powerful encounter. But I was, I was, I wouldn't feel good about it. You know, I just... I didn't want to tell anybody, although Bob was telling everybody. And I was going, they go, you're going to get in the Song of Solomon? I said, I mean, you know, little by little, you know, we're not going to just dive in right now. I mean, I was a Book of Romans, Life of David guy, you know. Second response, I began to study it out for the next couple of years, searching it. And the idea, the overarching promise or premise was it must be good because it's God. It, this is, this defines my future ministry and mandate in the Lord. This has to be good. I mean, because everything in the will of God is good, at least to our spirit. Maybe tough on our flesh sometimes. So I began to search it out. I went out and bought a bunch of books on it. I read it, couldn't understand any of it. It was so confusing, the terminology, the words, the symbolism, which is good because I have, I have mercy upon that feeling. And it was like a mountain. It was like a Goliath in front of me. But let me tell you, don't be afraid of the Song of Solomon. It's only, it's, there's only about 15 symbols in it. And once you get them, you have them, and the Bible interprets them. And it's not that difficult. And so I was, I, I was, said I gotta do it because it's, it has to be good because it's the will of God and it's my calling. So I began to study it out by faith with no feeling for it. My third response over the last number of years is wow, what an incredible calling. And I understand it as a calling to the first commandment, not just to the Song of Solomon, but to the bride, bridegroom revelation, the calling to the beauty of God and the beauty of the church, to the empowering of people to focus and walk in the first commandment so that they will have the ability to do the second commandment and the Great Commission. Now I understand it. I'm really happy about it. I am exhilarated, exhilarated by the message of the Song of Solomon. It's like, whoa, it is, it is the best. Now, I'm supposed to feel that way. You're supposed to feel that way about your calling. Now, all of you aren't going to get an audible voice calling to a book of the Bible. But some of you will identify with it as you hear this testimony. You'll say, I am called to the first commandment. That's, that, that defines what I'm about. I'm called to the bridegroom, bride, bridegroom revelation, the beauty of God, the beauty of his people, the first commandment. That's what I'm called to. And I hope that this testimony gives definition to your own life. Okay. Three main characters of the book. King Solomon is a picture of Jesus. Solomon, as the author of the song, I believe that that King Solomon wrote the song out of the fullness of the divine visitation that he had when when the Lord appeared to him and said, what do you want? Anything that you want. And Solomon said, I want wisdom. And I believe that he wrote this song out of the overflow of that wisdom that God gave him. The Shulamite woman is the, is the second main character of the book. She's a type or a picture of the bride of Christ who eventually experiences full spiritual maturity. She's introduced as a young maiden who becomes the mature bride. At first we refer to her as the maiden, but later, later we'll talk about her as the bride. She becomes the bride in the sense of she's living in the spirit of the bride later on in the book. The first four chapters, she's living like the maiden. But when I say she becomes the bride, I mean she's living in the spirit of bridehood, of which, again, uh, theologically is not a a reality in the fullness until heaven. This transition is recorded right in the middle of Song of Solomon 4.8. Okay. The third main characters are the daughters of Jerusalem. They appear throughout the book regularly. They are never clearly identified or defined. However... When we study what they do and what they say throughout the song, we learn that they love Jesus, but they never really press into the intimacy that the maiden or the bride does. I call her the maiden in the first half and the bride in the second half because she's living in the spirit of the bride in the second half. They, they love Jesus, but 
they are most characterized by spiritual dullness and passivity, but they clearly possess an, an inquisitive spirit, a sincere spirit to seek the Lord. The daughters of Jerusalem are pictured as those that have a lot of questions. They are very uh, perplexed by the fervency of the Shulamite. They keep saying to her things like, why do you do this? I don't get you. Tell me more what you see. So they're inquisitive. They're a step away. They're more interested in her and her fervor than they are even the Lord himself. They like the king, but they're always at a distance from him. They're more relating to the Shulamite saying, teach me what he taught you. This group seems to refer to those that are born again genuinely. At times, they even want to be near the king. However, they are usually depicted with some degree of spiritual dullness and passivity, which is the general condition of the whole church in the Western world. They personify a condition, is how I understand them. I would not at all feel comfortable about naming a class of Christians within the body of Christ as the daughters of Jerusalem. Like say, well, that group is more the bride, they're the daughters. No, 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 that's not it. They personify a condition, a condition that God is going to remedy by the power of the Holy Spirit and the revelation of Jesus. They're not an actual group of people that you can find in church history but they're, they're a picture. They personify a condition of passivity, yet with sincerity. They're not like the Pharisees who don't care. They, they want to go, but at their own pace, a little here, a little there. It's like the Laodicean spirit that's on the church today. Okay, comparing Ecclesiastes and the Song of Songs. Comparing Ecclesiastes and the Song of Songs. Both the Song and Ecclesiastes were written by Solomon, by the way. He wrote both of them. Most of you know, heck, Solomon wrote three books. Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Solomon. They're right there together. Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. King Solomon, which you know is David's son, wrote those three books of the Bible. Ecclesiastes was written to reveal the vanity of vanities of life under the sun. Or life in the natural arena. I use that phrase. Those of you that know Ecclesiastes know that's a, a main phrase in Ecclesiastes. He goes, vanity of vanities. Everything is vanities. He talks about like the holy of holies, the king of kings, the lord of lords. He, Solomon says vanity of vanities. It's the superlative. We'll look at that in the next session. That's the message of the book of Ecclesiastes. Everything under the sun, which means everything in the natural world without God is worth nothing. He says in Ecclesiastes, you can have everything in the world, but if you don't have reality with God on the inside, you don't really have anything, is what he's really saying. It's really a very, very philosophical book. Ecclesiastes stresses how impossible it is to be satisfied even with perfect circumstances. Ecclesiastes will tell you, Solomon will say, you can have all the gold, all the silver. He had all the relationships, he was handsome, wealthy, powerful, because you can have everything, and I'm telling you, you won't be satisfied. The book speaks of the endless wanderings of man who cannot find rest until he finds the rest in God, is the idea. He can't find rest until he finds his rest in God. The Song of Solomon reveals the true joy of life. It's very opposite. This is his other book. That can be attained without any regard to circumstances. You walk in Song of Solomon, you could be in a prison and your spirit is alive in the fullness of the glory of God. It highlights how meaningful everything is if you're walking in love with Jesus. Giving someone a cup of cold water has meaning and power and eternal rewards. Encouraging someone, pressing in, saying no to sin is recorded and rewarded in heaven. Everything has meaning and every movement of your heart has eternal meaning for glory in a good way. And the, bad, and the bad movements of your heart are forgiven in the blood of Jesus. It's fantastic. It's the only place of true satisfaction. If Ecclesiastes is properly understood, it's what awakens us to fervency for the Song of Solomon. I read Ecclesiastes. I, I remember the Lord pulled me into that book in some years uh, long ago. And I spent about a year on Ecclesiastes. And I didn't really... And I was getting downloaded with the biblical revelation, just a little bit, of everything you do, no matter matter how good it is, it won't ultimately matter if it's not found, if its roots aren't found in passion for God. You have the biggest ministry in the earth. It means nothing when you stand before God if God, if the thing wasn't flowing out of love. Ecclesiastes, in many ways, is the vital preparation for the Song of Songs. But just stay with Song of Songs for now. 
Because it's difficult to fervently seek fullness of life in Jesus and without understanding how futile life is outside of Jesus. Ecclesiastes speaks of life without rest and fulfillment. Based on worldly experience, knowledge, self-assertion. That's what the worldly philosophy is. Assert yourself. Get more experience. Get more of this. And Ecclesiastes says you'll never find ultimate fulfillment in that, in that flow of heart. Song of Solomon speaks of entering rest through humility, submission, and the impartation of love. It's a very opposite book. The Jewish fathers in the ancient times were known to relate the three books of Solomon to Solomon's temple. They were known to relate the three books of Solomon to the temple of Solomon. You know, the, the temple is Solomon built it. They, Proverbs related to the outer court of the temple. Ecclesiastes related to the holy place. And they said Song of Solomon was called the most holy place in God's theology. They, the Jewish fathers, a very common little uh, proverb or, of sorts, they said Proverbs is the outer court, Ecclesiastes is the inner court. Song of Solomon, they called the Holy of Holies. Amen. Well, this is just, uh, I'm just trying to prepare your mind, give you a little context for this book. Again, we're going to jump into it hard in, in, in the sessions ahead. This is just to kind of uh, prepare the, so you can know where to go with this book. Let's stand. Oh, Father, we love you. Lord, I know that some very people in this room, just even as I was telling that testimony, their spirit says, I'm called to the first commandment as my primary focus of ministry. We're all called to it as our li- for our lives before God, but as your primary focus of ministry. To the bridal revelation, the revelation of the bridegroom, the first commandment, the beauty of the Lord, these kind of themes. The Lord, I ask even in this introductory session that you would seal the hearts of your people. Lord, we know you're going to seal. That seal has many, many installments to it. It's not a one-time deal, that seal on the heart. Lord, I ask that as you prepare to fill the church and the earth, I know it's the truth, with this bridal love of fire, Lord, I ask you to begin to seal people even in these early days. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. This concludes this tape presentation from Friends of the Bridegroom. For more information on resources available from Mike Bickle, as well as news about upcoming conferences and live broadcasts, visit our website at www.fotb.com. Thank you.